Welcome to God is Open. I am your host, Christopher Fisher. Today on God is Open, we're going to be talking about Proverbs, especially, particularly, the book of Proverbs in the Hebrew Bible. And we're going to talk first, real quickly, about American Proverbs to try to get us in the right state of mind for reading these Proverbs, seeing how to read them, what they mean, um, and the general applicability of these Proverbs, and how not to read these Proverbs. How not to read Proverbs is a good lesson that we need to take to heart. So I got these American Proverbs put up. The first one is you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs. Now, if this was in the Bible, we might come to it and say, oh, yes. Um, so these guys were omelet makers. They made some omelets. And uh, there's a principle that you do have to break your eggs before you make the omelet. Not what this is about whatsoever. This proverb, although it uses words like omelet and eggs, it's not about omelets, it's not about eggs. I think this, this proverb was uh, coined by Robespierre during the French Revolution where they took anyone that they saw was in uh, the upper classes and they executed them. And his meaning of the phrase was, you can't get to your goal and state society without killing a few people. And Stalin would adopt this uh, proverb as well for his reign of terror in which he murdered millions of individuals. And so the general general meaning of this is you can't get to an end state without doing a few undesirable things. But this is not about making omelets. It's not always about mass murder, although it's been used for mass murder. Maybe, maybe it's uh, something in business. You can't get to your end state of your business without some bad things happening, you having to go through some trials and tribulations, doing some undesirable things to get to your end state. How about this next one? Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Again, this is not about eggs. This is not about baskets. This is not about farming. Instead, this is a general principle for our life that we need to diversify our resources because if we put all our resources into one endeavor, if that endeavor fails, then we'd be kaput. We'd be, we'd be broke and we would be ruined. So diversification allows us to uh, branch out. But, but notice something about these proverbs. They're not universally uh, exportable. They're, they're, not, they're not metaphysical truths. And so if someone went all in in Bitcoin back in the, the, the 90s and early 2000s or whenever Bitcoin started, they'd be a multimillionaire today. And so it would have worked out for them. And some people have. They're called Bitcoin millionaires. Um, and so this is not always true, but it's general rules, general advice to how to, how to live your life in the best possible way to maximize your benefit. That's what these proverbs do. They give us general rules of thumb, which are not universally true, but just generally general instructions, general ideas for life. There's more than one way to skin a cat. Whenever I hear this, I've heard this quite often in my life, it's never about skinning cats. I don't know anyone who's ever skinned a cat. I don't know any cat that's ever been skinned, anything like that. Um, but this phrase in American, in our Proverbs, means that there's more than one angle of approach to the same problem. There's multiple avenues where you could reach the same objectives. There's more than one way to skin a cat. Again, not about cats. It's about general applicable concepts to life. So now let's turn to the Bible. We will look at the book of Proverbs. And we'll just kind of read through some of the Proverbs and to see how they're being written and what they mean generally. How about this? 17.1. Better is a dry morsel with a quiet house than a house full of feasting with strife. And the idea of this proverb is... You know, being rich is all nice and good and all, but uh, not if you're living in a chaotic, crazy house. There, there's the proverb where it's better to live in on the roof of a corner than with a quarrelsome wife. Also, also true. What what the idea is? Don't marry. Don't don't uh, get involved with uh, bickering women, and because it'll make your life misery, misery. And it's better to live alone. Uh, or Paul says he says. Uh, sometimes you, you don't have to marry. You could be single. 
And uh, not my advice for people, but Paul's advice for people to stay single. But but that is a general truth. Not 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 a hundred percent universal. So I'm, I'm sure there are some situations in which a dry morsel does not beat feasting with strife. Uh, like if you're starving or something like that, you, you probably might want that full feasting. But the general idea is there. The general idea is exportable to multiple areas of life. It doesn't even have to be about food. It could be just like you have a nice, quiet room. You, you're living in um, poverty. And, you know, that's probably better for you. Uh, you'll probably enjoy that more than living with a luxurious wealth and then uh, being in a bickering, chaotic household, dealing with all sorts of interpersonal drama and relationship. That is the exportable concept from this. Not necessarily about food. The crucible is for silver, the furnace is for gold, and the Lord tests the hearts. So what this proverb is doing is it's drawing parallels between fa fairly different concepts. There's refining process in, in silver and gold to drive out impurities. And God acts in that fashion towards us. Remember, this is just a general proverb. So it would be probably a huge mistake to say that uh, God does this to all people everywhere, always. Just the general concept is God refines people's hearts, just like crucibles do silver and furnaces do gold. Here's one. Fine speech is not becoming to a fool, still less is false speech to a prince. So it's basically saying there are certain classes of people who shouldn't be speaking in, in certain fashions. I think fine speech is not becoming to a fool. That reminds me of uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet play where Polonius... Oh, the wise old guy. He just bumbles on like a fool throughout the play. And so he's he's cast as kind of like a comical, I'm giving sage advice, but he's he's actually just a fool giving this advice. And people are like, yeah, okay, sure. Just keep talking. And then he gets killed. And it, But uh, just imagine a fool giving a speech. Someone who's ridiculous. Someone who doesn't know what they're talking about giving a speech. Fine speech is not becoming to the fool, still less is false speech to a prince. So rulers, not necessarily princes, but people in positions of power should execute integrity. They should not lie to people. They should speak honestly and bluntly. And uh, tact is fine. Tact is fine. But they shouldn't be telling lies because when when uh, people in positions of power, I don't lie to my kids. And so if you lie to your kids, then you set up this idea when they find out that you've lied, you lose respect in their eyes. You They, they say, oh, if you lied to me about Santa Claus, you might lie to me about Jesus, right? So you don't lie to your kids. Uh, don't lie to your kids, period. So if you're in a position of power, uh, false speech is not becoming to you. Here's one. Let a man meet a she-bear robbed of her cubs rather than a fool in his folly. So if, if you're hanging around with uh, self-destructive people and uh, that's going to destroy your life even worse than being maimed by a bear. I mean, a bear could kill you, but there is there is an element of hyperbole in, in different proverbs. And so it's basically saying it's better for you to be physically mauled and attacked rather than to get get caught up in in uh, someone's self-destructive lifestyle. And that makes sense. So we understand what's what's going on there and it's generally generally exportable. It's it's not 100% true in all situations. I'm sure there's some bear attacks that's going to be worse than some getting involved in follies. But the general principle does hold true. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to the Lord. And so the general principle here is that it's equally as bad to justify the wicked or say the wicked are good as it is to say that the good are wicked. Those are parallel concepts, generally exportable and uh, generally disdained by God. So I don't think it's talking metaphysics. I'm not, I don't think it's talking, um, this has equal value to this. Just, just think about if uh, the American proverb, it better to have a bird in the hand rather than two in the bush. Now, every time I've heard that, absolutely zero people have actually been talking about bird catching. In fact, 
I don't know anyone who's ever went bird catching. Uh, bird catching, I guess, is a thing that from back in the 1800s or something like that. But uh, what what the par parable means is it's not telling your relative value of birds. You don't add up. You're like, okay, so two birds versus one. And so the one in the hand has 200% value of the birds in the bush. It's not saying that. It's just basically saying the general principle is it's better to have things that you actually have rather than things that you don't have which could you could have better is to have something tangible than something probable but in the same sense it's not necessarily that all situations of justifying wicked and condemning righteous are of equal of equal uh, condemnation to god but their general principles that they, they they're they're two sides of the same coin and god hates both of them so now let's turn to some calvinist psalms the ones that the calvinists really like and i i think they like them because they over spiritualize or uh, make metaphysical absolutes just general proverbs and so it, it kind of says something that they like and so um then they latch onto it and they say this is a metaphysical absolute so they don't treat it in the same fashion that we would treat all the other proverbs we've already re read even the proverbs that we've read from the book of Proverbs, we understand they're telling loose truths. There's some hyperbole used sometimes, and it's generally applicable. At in some some situations, not applicable. They're just general proverbs. We, we understand how proverbs work. And just using American proverbs as an example, a bird in hand is better than two in the bush. Um, nobody nobody catches birds and it's not about birds so proverbs 16 33 the lot is cast in the lap but it's every decision is from the lord so this is uh talking about rolling dice so you roll dice you're playing monopoly and uh the go to jail is in in like five moves and then you roll it and then it says go to jail you, you get the five and uh, then you have to go to jail and so is this proverb is this proverb saying that uh, God sent you to jail in Monopoly? I don't think so. I, I don't. I don't particularly think that this is about Monopoly dice rolls at all. Even though it talks about dice, remember, uh, a bird in the hand is better than two in the bush. Is not about birds. Uh, you you need to break a couple eggs to make an omelet. It's not about making omelets. It's not about eggs. Instead, there's a general principle probably at play. Probably at play here. This is probably not, this is a metaphysical truth that God determines all the rules of every dice to ever roll ever. No, instead the general truth that's probably being communicated here is that there seems to be elements of randomness in our lives, but God is directing the overall story. God is at play. God is at work, even in a world filled with seemingly random events. That's probably what's going on here. Better than, better than any explanation of this verse that talks about rolling dice. If, if you're talking about rolling dice in, in this proverb, you're probably not understanding the proverb. So who is communicating what to whom? Is this meant to communicate to Israel that God just controls all dice rolls? I mean, some people try to link this verse to like the Urim and Thurim or, or any of their divination uh, techniques in ancient Israel to determine the will of God. I don't think that's what this is talking about. I just don't. I think this is more of a general principle that God controls the world even if there's a lot of seeming randomness. That, that appears to be the thrust of this proverb. I don't think this proverb is teaching teaching young Israelites that God controls dice rolls. I just don't. In the same way that uh, breaking a couple eggs to make an omelet is not teaching young Americans about making omelets. It's, it's not an object lesson. It's drawing parallels between two concepts to illustrate a general idea. So, uh, turning to a proverb making it metaphysical, making it absolute, probably not the best idea, especially for generating generating your theology. Let's look at the general context too. Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. 
So basically, it's just saying that uh, it's better to be control of yourself than a mighty ruler. Okay, so that doesn't actually give us real context to 1633. 1633, stand alone. 17.1, we already read about that uh, dry morsel. Better to eat a dry morsel than to have a feast in a quarrelsome household. <laughs> just clicking randomly. Proverbs 19.1, better is a poor person who walks in his integrity than one who is crooked in speech and is a fool. There's a Jack Handy quote, and he says, I'd rather be rich than stupid. It kind of, kind of reminds me of that one just a little bit. I, that's a good proverb too. It's better to be rich than stupid. <laughs> Proverbs 19.5, a false witness will not go unpunished, and he who breathes out lies will not escape. I don't believe that this verse is talking about the final judgment uh, when people rise and they have to give account before God. I think this proverb, proverbs tend to be of use to the people who are reading the proverbs. It gives them something of understanding, something of use, how to live their current lives now. And uh, I think what this is saying is that our lies eventually come back to haunt us. There's, there's some sort of repercussion that we get in the here and now for being a liar. So it's even verses like 18.5 in which you could come up with an explanation like, oh, this is about the final judgment, we'll be raised and we'll have to account for our deeds. I, I just don't think that's what's going on here in this particular proverb because proverbs don't, they're, they're not about that. They're, they're not about setting down doctrine and they're not about setting up metaphysics and, and, and how the divine realm works works and functions maybe in loose terms in loose terms like the eyes of god are on the ways of the good and evil let's so let's let's turn to that verse real quick proverbs 15 3 the eyes of the lord are in every place keeping watch on the evil and the good and so eyes of the lord what, what do the eyes of the lord mean uh is it talking about divine eyes often in ancient uh, near east type religions um, various eyes when deities had multiple eyes that would indicate some sort of omniscience. Like uh, Janus, the two-faced god, had eyes in the back of his head so that he could watch all things. And there's uh, there's uh, references to gods with thousands of eyes, and that those signify omniscience. Or is this doing something like uh, in the Bible where it talks about the seven eyes of the Lord roam around the face of the world, looking at uh, the good and the evil. Is, is that what, what's happening here? That these eyes are spies of God? These are independent agents that report back to God in a scene kind of like Job? It could be all these things. It could be just a, a general idea that you're being watched in some fashion um, when you're doing things. But is this like a metaphysical absolute? So do, is, is this a proof text for omniscience? Well, certainly not classical omniscience in which God doesn't watch to gain information. Certainly, it's not a proof text for that. But uh, is it a proof text for just general omniscience? I guess you could say general omniscience, but general exhaustive omniscience, probably, probably not. Because just the way that Proverbs structure, are structured and how they function, having a verse like this in Proverbs that talks about God's general surveillance of human beings well, first of all, it'd be a mistake to say, oh, that means he's watching rocks on the bottom of the ocean. That would be a mistake. And it would even be a mistake to just think this is about all people, all their actions are always being recorded in some fashion somewhere. That's just not how Proverbs work. If you want some sort of proof like that, you'd have to turn to a different book, probably. You'd have to turn to something that actually describes that process going on. Whereas Proverbs are general. We, we just read a bunch about uh, evil people and, and not being involved with fools and stuff. They're just, just general principles for life. And the general idea here is that you're going to have to account to God for the things that you're doing. Uh, generally. Not necessarily that he's watching you at every second of every day, recording everything you do. That might be stretching it a little too far. You'd have to. If, if you'd have to turn to some other verses, texts in the Bible that are not in the format of Proverbs. That's the, that's the problem with Proverbs. They're just not general. Uh, they're not, not universal metaphysical rules. They're general concepts that are applicable to our life that are useful to us in some fashion. Look just down here, 1510. There is severe discipline for him who forsakes the way. Whoever hates reproof will die. 
Now, when did uh, Stalin die? Stalin died a fairly old man. Hugh Hefner died a pretty old man. And so it's not like these things are super universal where they always come true. And it's not, and this, this verse is not, they will die when they get really old and then die of old age peacefully in their sleep. That's, that's not what this is about. This is setting down the general principle that people who don't listen to feedback are self-destructive and generally, generally will be, have their lives destroyed. But it's not true in all cases, as we see, we see throughout history. Let's, let's switch real quick to another Calvinist proverb. A Calvinist proverb in the sense that they like to turn to this proverb to try to prove one of the things that they believe. Proverbs 16.4, the Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. And so uh, they, they say, see, God makes all things. God creates all things and they all have this, this purpose and, and universal determinism is true. Uh, that's just an incorrect way to read Proverbs, if that's your conclusion coming from just how Proverbs function and work coming from this verse. It's probably, probably that's being too absolutist in this genre, in this genre of literature. And so there, there's other translations of this that make this more sensible, something that give people some sort of idea how to act and how, how to live their lives. Remember, that's that's really the purpose of Proverbs is to give us practical, practical, not metaphysical doctrine, practical advice. And so the Lord has made everything for his purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. Let's see what the NIV, how the NIV translates that verse. NIV states, the Lord works out everything to its proper end, even the wicked for the day of disaster. That actually seems a little bit more useful. It tells us that we shouldn't be wicked because our ultimate end would be some sort of destruction from God. It, probably not the final judgment. Uh, it could be the final judgment, um, but probably just like their general demise is probably what's going on there. So this verse would be a mistake to take this proverb and make it into a metaphysical absolute where there's common sense understandings and readings which give the listener practical advice. So let's say the Calvinist reading of this was true, that this is a metaphysical verse teaching us that God controls all things. There's a purpose for God building wicked people and is to punish them. What? What practical advice does that give people how to live their life? It, it doesn't. It's it's not a proverb. Certainly, it's not a proverb. That would be just like, this is not the book of doctrines. This is the book of Proverbs. It probably, it probably belong in a different book and uh, not be very much use here in the book of Proverbs. So let's turn to Proverbs twenty one one. This is another uh, common Calvinist proverb that they like to like to talk about. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. And so what this proverb is saying, is this saying that God decides all decisions that kings ever make in all respect, uh, if they want to have chocolate ice cream or vanilla ice cream for breakfast, that God is there deciding which type of ice cream that that king has. I don't think that's the idea that this proverb is trying to get uh, through to us. I think instead this is saying that God controls national events. God, God is working out things on a global scale for his end goal. That God is able to manipulate and guide and get his plans accomplished. This is telling people about the state of the world, the state of God's control. Again, you do see those those control statements, uh, the, just like the lot is cast, but every decision is from the Lord, is about teaching people about God's sovereignty. We'll use the word sovereignty, not in the Calvinist sense, in the normal sense, um, normal dictionary definition of sovereignty, not the, not the secret, uh, secret squirrel Calvinist, Calvinist dictionary um, understanding of sovereign. This is just teaching us about God's control, God's dealings with man, uh, God working out his end game, and God doing things. Just like our other stuff where the end, are, the end of the wicked, God is going to bring about punishment for those who are liars, who, who are cheating. Uh, God's involved and God will exact justice. Doesn't mean it always happens in all instances. Again, these are not metaphysical truths. These are general rules of thumb. 
with exceptions. With exceptions, typically, it's how these Proverbs work. So we could take a literal example of God guiding the hearts of kings. Uh, the, King Ahab, King, King Ahab, God decided, hey, how do we get this guy to go into battle and get himself killed? So he crowdsources the angels for ideas, and then one gives him idea to go plant false false uh, prophecies in all the false prophets. And he says, okay, that, that'll, that'll work. Go do that. And then they get Ahab to go into battle and get killed. And so that's a practical example of this, this verse playing out, this proverb playing out. But I think it would be a mistake to make this into metaphysics, make this into something like teaching doctrine. Proverbs are not doctrine. <laughs> we, we should probably repeat that again. Proverbs are not doctrine. Proverbs are proverbs. And it's good to read it in the Proverbs literature style. Read them as if they are Proverbs. And a probably a good practice is if you're reading a proverb, you should probably read the Proverbs around it to just get the general sense of how these Proverbs function Bef before going out to a debate and then you're Matt Slick and you throw, throw it out there to Will Duffy and you say, see, see right here, God uh, made wicked people in order to destroy them. <laughs> probably what's not going on there. That's pro that's probably, you're probably misreading the Proverbs, uh, Mr. Matt Slick. That's probably what's happening. Here's a nice one. Proverbs 21, 12. The righteous one observes the house of the wicked. He throws the wicked down to ruin. So as righteous people, we should go out and just ruin the wicked. Yeah? Take that to the bank. Go out and start ruining. I, I don't know what, what that means. Like break into their house, break into Bill Gates' house and flip his tables. You're just flipping his tables everywhere. Whoever closes his ear to the cry of the poor will himself call out and not be answered. That if you're not listening to other people's Please for help. Um, you yourself is going to be ignored. Kind of like a retributive type of justice going on here. Not always, not always the case. What is it? Yogi Berra. One of his proverbs was, if you don't go to other people's funerals, they're not going to go to yours. <laughs> Whoever loves pleasure will be a poor man. He who loves wine and oil will not be rich. Well, I know a lot of rich people who love wine. I don't know about oil these days. Maybe essential oils probably that but a lot of them tend to be rich a lot of them tend to be rich we're going to try to hit as many calvinist proverbs as we can so we'll turn to proverbs 1921 many are the plans of the mind of man but it is the purpose of the lord that will stand so like man might have our plans um but if they conflict with god's god's gonna just override them and just power through because god is powerful to do that and so the calvinists see this proverb and they say see we can't thwart god in any sense whatsoever because they're making it a metaphysical absolute. Probably, probably not. This is probably about God's going to generally prevail over us when it comes to any struggles of will or conflict or, or making the right things happen. But one thing God can't do throughout the Bible, he cannot do, is uh, get wayward Israel to come and return and repent to him. He says, how often... Uh, I wanted to hold you, you know, like the hen holds her chickens, but you were not willing. The lawyers resisted the will of God for themselves. The bula, my will. Um, so this is probably not a, like a metaphysical absolute that no one in any sense can thwart God in any sense. But it's just about when there's there's conflicts in those instances in which God is is striving with man for an outcome to an event, God's going to win these things. God's going to win these things because God is powerful and man generally, generally doesn't have too much power. So we talked a lot about uh, Calvinist Psalms that they like, and but the Psalms are very open theistic in how they're written and what they say. Just take a look at the one where the eyes of the Lord are in every place uh, watching the good and the evil. God receives knowledge from outside himself. That's open theism right there. Anytime that we see where God delights in something, that's God receiving from outside himself. Anytime we see God's emotions, uh, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Meaning don't cheat people because cheating people is a sin. God delights, God delights in honesty and integrity. God receives from outside himself. God has emotions. And we see this throughout the Psalms. God's thought process being displayed. God's thought process. Open theism is true if God has a thought process.
we'll just do a search on Lord within Proverbs in the ESV. This one's uh, interesting. It says uh, Proverbs uh, 2, 4, and 5. If you seek it like silver and search for it as hidden treasures, then you'll understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Oh, wow. That doesn't sound like monergism at all. It sounds, it sounds like people can... Uh, through their own efforts, achieve knowledge of God. That doesn't sound like Calvinism. That's not in the modern Jerusalem. Proverbs 3.11, do not despise the Lord's discipline and be wary of his reproof. We can choose, we can choose to respond to God. And uh, it's, it's not, it's not a, a foregone conclusion what, what route we do take. We are given advice to to listen to God when he tries to teach us something. It's not always successful. Not God's God's teaching, his reproof, are not always successful. As God writes, as it as it Ezekiel, where um, I punished their children in vain. So, so the intended outcome of the punishment did not materialize. God did something in vain. Proverbs five twenty one: For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. And so, God God is thinking about what men are doing. God's thinking, he ponders it. He's, he's pondering it. Uh, okay, so that's pretty open theistic. God has discursive thoughts, ideas, is receiving real-time information. There are six things that the Lord hates. Wow, God hates things. God has emotions. God has strong emotions. A good man obtains favor from the Lord, Proverbs 12, 2, but a man of evil devices he condemns. And so people can obtain, obtain favor for, of God through their own acts, you know, that's not that's not the monergism going on here. It's not like the Calvinists say that, oh, even your good acts, if you're not in God, are, are uh, so evil and wicked, and it's not counted as good because you're not doing it with the right spirit. It's like, that's not that's not what's going on here. It's, it's talking about God looks at how people act, and then God responds accordingly. It's none of this Calvinist, um, you need to be regenerate nonsense. Proverbs fifteen twenty nine. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. So God responds to prayer. That's a pretty big theme throughout the Bible, God responding to prayer. Open theism is true and universally taught within the Bible. Anyways, we're going to basically cut off there. I think I hit all the major proof texts that the Calvinists like to use in the Psalms. But if there's other ones that I missed, just, just let me know. We'll make a list and we'll make sure we respond to all these Psalms. But the Psalms overall is very open theistic. People can affect God. People can reach God. The Psalms are, are about practical, practical living. And in that sense, uh, reaching and affecting God's heart is a main theme because it tells us what to do to gain God's favor. It tells us what to do, how to live a good life. It's not giving us metaphysical doctrine, though. It, it's just not. We shouldn't be reading the Proverbs as if it's metaphysics. But we can, we can kind of see their mentality, their mindset in relation to who God is, how God operates, how God acts, how God thinks, and what God likes and doesn't like. These general principles, uh, they materialize throughout the entire book of Proverbs. Anyways, questions or comments, put that down below. Uh, start a thread on the God is Open Facebook page. Thank you for listening.